Medieval Times Dinner and Tournament is a rite of passage for most red-blooded Americans. Sure, eating chicken without forks has its charm, but it's hardly historically accurate to the real medieval times. A real medieval diet could be surprisingly heart-healthy, featuring items that are trendy and recognizable in our modern era. Today, we're going to explore what the average medieval diet was like. But before we chow down, be sure to say grace by subscribing to Weird History and let us know what you're eating while watching this video. Now, put on that bib and let's dig in. Though it might feel like more of a recent trend, people in the medieval times would get down with some alternative dairy products. Much like a home in the hippie-filled Topanga Canyon, almond milk was a common pantry household in medieval Europe. It was often used in times of fasting, when the church required people to abstain from consuming animal products. It also didn't spoil as quickly as cow or goat's milk, and could be whipped up into butter and used in an array of dishes. Almond milk was such a staple of the time, most medieval cookbooks contain recipes featuring almond milk as main ingredient. While medieval knights weren't taking chariots through late night drive through to drunkenly eat a medium Big Mac combo with a Coke, there was a variation of fast food in the Middle Ages. Archaeologists probably won't find an ancient, decrepit pair of golden arches, but they did have places that served meat pies, hotcakes, pancakes, and wafers prepared for immediate consumption. Wait, that actually sounds more like the Waffle House. According to researchers at Penn State, these medieval McDonald's had a similar reputation as Mickey D's as being lower in quality, if not still very tasty, and were thought of as dirty and dishonest. Researchers also discovered these fast, casual joints of yore used the term meat loosely, sometimes using tainted rabbit in meat pies that probably were not labeled rancid rabbit meat pies. Just like Greg in the office, medieval peasants loved bread. A typical diet of a medieval European included two to three pounds of bread and grain per day, including the gallon of grainy, low alcohol percentage ale for which to wash it down. Peasants got creative with their grains, such as wheat, oats, and barley, boiling them down into a mushy bowl of porridge or baking a loaf of bread. Rarely did they pair their carbs with red meat, opting instead to use peas, lentils, or fish to satisfy their protein needs. The calories on this naturally added up, with two and a half pounds of rye bread amounting to 3,000 calories or five and a half Big Macs, which is far too much for most people at one time. Factor in the gallon of ale, contributing an additional 1,500 calories, and it's a wonder the medieval times wasn't full of obese peasants. But with 12-hour workdays of actual labor, they probably had calories to spare. As would be the case at today's medieval times restaurants, raw fruits and vegetables had no business on most medieval times dinner tables. Researchers from the British Library Board discovered that fruits and vegetables were almost always cooked in the Middle Ages due to the belief that raw fruits and veggies were riddled with disease. A feature of vegetables still happening today, as evidenced by the myriad of romaine lettuce and spinach recalls. In the Book of Carving from the year 1500, readers were cautioned against consuming salads and raw fruits. Beware of green salads and raw fruits, for they will make your master sick. Aromatic fresh herbs were not lumped with their sickly, leafy green brothers, and were often used for medicine and cooking. A salad at the dinner table was not completely unheard of for the lower class citizens of the Middle Ages, however, with salat filling the bellies of the plebeians designated just good enough for food that came from the dirty ground. Carrots, turnips, and other root vegetables were considered a more peasanty food. A commoner salad may consist of a variety of vegetables such as lettuce, onions, and carrots, and even mixed in with oil, nuts, or olives, or what sounds like a typical side salad at most Italian restaurants. The rich typically shunned the vegetable, a word that was rarely used to describe produce, but would deem the occasional onion, garlic, or leek to be worthy of their dinner table spread and, unfortunately for the booze, their mouths. The stereotypical image of a medieval feast features a full roasted pig as its centerpiece, and the image was, in fact, quite a common occurrence at the dinner table for anyone who was well-to-do. Pork was considered one of the highest on the hog of meats and fat in medieval Europe, and the suckling pig, in particular, was a coveted main course. A suckling pig is what it sounds like, a very young pig who was most likely suckling on its mother's teat before being made into dinner. Like veal today, whose preparation is not far off from its young swine friend, the meat was considered a delicacy. Historians agree that suckling pig was a real status symbol as far as meat affluence goes. Sow's womb was also a delicacy that appeared in medieval cookbooks. Mmm, succulent suckling.
often referred to as the most important meal of the day now, back in these days, breakfast was for the fatties and the people who were working their tails off, or at least according to medieval priest Thomas Aquinas. Thomas thought eating too soon at the beginning of the day, or pre propri for all the fans of Latin, was just one of the many ways to commit one of the seven deadly sins of gluttony. The Middle Ages meal plan, which will be all the rage with influencers in no time, consisted of skipping breakfast, a light midday dinner, and a hearty evening supper. Occasionally, some hungry little rascals would sneak in a third meal called re re supper or rear supper with wine and ale, but that was frowned upon. Laborers would eat something akin to breakfast in the morning before heading off to a strenuous 12-hour workday, but wasn't no Denny's moons over my hammy. It was more of a piece of biscuit or something to just fill the belly before that light midday supper break as to not pass out in the fields. Meat was a hot commodity in this era, which made it hard to come by for the plebeians of the time, but even the wealthy weren't extremely picky. Records from the time list a luxurious smorgasbord of meat on the menu including vultures, cranes, hedgehogs, who we are assuming are mostly needles, seals, and whales, just to name a few. At one specific yummy light dinner thrown by Archbishop Neville of York in 1467, a guest list of 6,000 people managed to eat their way through several tons of meat, including swans, peacocks, and over 13,500 nonspecific birds, and washed that all down with 400 casks worth of alcohol. With no easy access to a honey-baked ham for a Christmas dinner, our medieval friends had to make do. Though occasionally the king would allow for a Christmas swan, it was mainly the traditional Christmas goose for both the extremely wealthy and the less extremely wealthy for the holiday meal. Rich folk smothered their fancy geese with a snobby rich people rub consisting of butter and saffron, while it's assumed poorer families had a bland goose that cost them a whole day's pay. But the rich and the poor enjoyed an humble pie, which, yes, is where the expression humble pie originated from. But man, did it sound very interesting. Humble pie was pie made of deer or another animal's edible entrails cooked into a pie. Beans were the real culinary game changer once they entered the scene for medieval Europeans. Umberto Eco argued that when the cultivation of legumes began to spread in the 10th century, it made such an impact on the nutrition of the population, it was a major factor in the survival of Western civilization. That might sound hyperbolic, but the addition of beans to the diets of hard workers meant more protein for a society where meat was hard to come by for the less economically advantaged. The population doubled within a few hundred years after beans hit the plates of Europeans. Coincidence? Well, maybe. But keep in mind, beans were thought of as an aphrodisiac. Yes, you know the famous saying, beans, beans, the magical fruit. The more you eat, the more you want to make babies. Baking wars these days might refer more to cute baking competitions between amateur home chefs on Netflix, but back in the Middle Ages, it was taken a little more literally. Baking was a very serious business in these times, with commercial bakers forming powerful guilds that functioned as a cross between a union and the mob. Bakers who joined would pay a fee, making them exclusive members of a club of bakers for a certain region. Those fees acted essentially as an insurance and could pay off down the road if anything ever, um, happened to your business or your family. Beautiful bakery. Be a shame if something happened to it. Nah, wait. It's insured by the guild, and it would be fine. The guilds also protected the family recipes of master bakers, assuming that nobody else would open bakeries using a stolen recipe from a guild-protected baker. These guilds sure didn't flam around. Sweets were not likely a treat for the commoners of the Middle Ages, but not completely unheard of in the middle class. A middle class feast was often traditionally served as one would a family style dinner today, with several courses landing at the table at once, as opposed to several courses paced throughout the evening. With this gluttonous feast of cartoon like proportions, desserts were interspaced between the courses as a kind of palate cleanser, which is how dessert should be served, all the time after every single bite of food. One such dessert was known as a soltity, which was described as an elaborate ornamental offering made from dough or marzipan, often depicting a thematically appropriate theme for the occasion such as night battle or baking guild enrollment ceremony. King Richard III, being a king and all, sure did eat like one, right up until his death in the last Battle of the Roses in 1485. How do we know this? He ate so richly it funneled down into his bones. Archaeologists, geochemists, 
and other researchers analyzed King Richard's bones and were able to conclude that he did, in fact, eat a rich, high-status diet of a wealthy aristocrat, which makes sense. Specifically, the researchers were able to miraculously narrow down his diet to include plenty of freshwater fish and wildfowl, and in his last few years, a bunch of wine, just by examining his bones. Richard III may have been the last plantagenic king of England, but he had the dietary bones of a suburban housewife in ketosis. The Mediterranean diet gets all the hype for being a heart-healthy alternative to standard American diets of cheeseburgers and donuts, but really the medieval diet is the one that should be glorified on all the pages of Goop. The folks back in the Middle Ages didn't have the modern medicine we have now, and the Black Death thing wasn't great, but in general, people then had a better diet for the human heart than most people have today. Eating three pounds of bread may not sound heart-healthy, but it was more nuanced than that. This civilization lacked the refined sugars found in many foods today, and workers actually worked participating in heart-healthy exercise just to get a paycheck, with the benefit of living longer as a fun little bonus. Dr. Roger Henderson told the BBC his research concluded that the medieval man was at much lower risk for coronary heart disease and diabetes than the modern man, and suggested it as a better model for us in the 21st century than the much ballyhooed Mediterranean diets. Don't feel guilty about eating pounds of bread smothered in almond butter while shunning the salad bar. Just tell the people it's the medieval diet and laugh as you live forever. Just be sure to work a 12-hour workday six days a week. So what do you think? Are you currently eating bread? We see you. Let us know what medieval food you would like to try in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our weird history.